Good afternoon, good people in India. Beautiful weather here in Bangalore. I hope the same is the case everywhere, wherever you're joining in from and from outside the country as well. We see a couple few of them. Amutu, your video is off. You might want to switch on the video so you can wave hi to everyone. Yes, uh, absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, so let's get this started. Um, I'm Sumit Podar, a group product manager at Intuit. And, um, and I love to be here. I love Mutu and I actually love doing these sessions over and over again. Um, I think we are all on a mission of sorts to make sure that product managers basically take over the world. And uh, it begins with you folks, all hundreds of you folks starting to do that. We'll give you a few tricks and Mutu will be taking us through the session today on how to begin the journey to become an awesome product manager for tomorrow today. So without much further ado, Mutu, take it away. Perfect. Okay, so what are we going to uh, cover in today's session? We are going to talk about the story of Intuit as a product company, the journey, how we have gone through the products that we do and why we do what we do more importantly uh, and the product thinking and the design thinking flavor that we bring in uh, for the innovation uh, with all that we are doing. Uh, going on to uh, what, what do our product managers do and what are some of the best, pro uh, you know, best practices that anyone who aspires to become become an awesome product manager can take away from the same uh, and then uh, we do know that in today's call we have aspirants who want to transition into product management and here we cover you as well uh, some of the tips and uh, what you can do on to transition into product management as well so those are the two uh, let's say the three main topics that we are going to cover for today uh, starting with uh, uh, starting with into it Yep, absolutely. So, now remember everyone, um, you have a Q&A panel right there on the right. So please do engage with us using the Q&A panel if you have got questions. Remember also everyone, you've got a chat panel. You can chat, you can send in your messages to us, good, bad, any messages. Um, and if you have any trouble with logistics, etc., feel free to send a note to the panelists and we will take care of that. So we'll be answering your questions, listening to your chats and eagerly waiting for you to engage with us. Absolutely. Uh, we would like to be as engaging as possible. Uh, so when, when you have some thoughts running on, uh, just uh, you know, chat it out to us and we will, we will try to address during the session. Uh, so uh, Intuit runs with this key mission of powering prosperity around the world. Uh, and when we say something from Intuit, it is always measurable. Uh, uh, we, we would we like to always measure the impact what we say uh, of or, or what we want to do. Uh, so this is uh, when we say powering prosperity around the world, this is purely measurable because we go against the goal of doubling the household savings rate. This is because of our consumer segment products like the uh, like the tax products and the and the personal finance products, etc and then improving the small business success rate by 10 points higher than the industry average by giving them the best uh, small business solutions that they require making sure that their accounting and the finance needs are met uh, so so that's that's you know let's say the uh, the 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 mission that runs uh, every product that we do and why we do what we do so uh, that's that's also the reason. Uh, uh, I mean, uh, uh, today we are one of the world's leading companies, uh, uh, you know, recognized by several brands like Fortune and Forbes, uh, and several uh, uh, awards that includes the most admired so software award to the uh, to the best companies to work for and the most innovative companies. Uh, and even in India, uh, we are a we are a great place to work. Actually, we have been in the list for several years now, uh, and in the last three years specifically we are we have always been in the top top two rankings and we are also a best play, workplace known for career management culture of innovation uh, that that goes without saying because of our uh, because of our product thinking and the design driven company and the and the value that we have built over a period of time uh, and the women at work because of the best practices that we have built around uh, for all the all the employees for that matter um, now, where did it all start from? Actually, it all started at a kitchen table 35 years ago. 
uh, when our founder, uh, Scott Cook, uh, while he was watching his wife, trying to balance the checkbook and then she was going you know uh, you know why is it why is this not balancing and he was like you know why should this be so difficult can there not be an easy way to around easy way around uh, you know managing the finances and that curiosity and that observation start uh, uh, you know uh, uh, spiked that or sparked that innovation of going into the direction of you know how do we simplify this with a simple uh, finance software simple personal finance and a house whole finance software that can uh, uh, that can solve this right so the so the difference uh, that it made in that day's market back then is that he actually looked it from users perspective so it was actually several screens were actually resembling uh, the actual physical artifact that they would be interacting with. Like for example, a screen like a checkbook, a screen like an in, looks like an invoice and you can directly make the entries. There isn't anything that you are required to be learning new and speaking the business language, not the accountant language, which the, which the small business were fearing away from, which led to the success of, uh, you know, building the uh, product for several years, it had been a market lead in that space uh, and of course over the years we have even uh, you know uh, uh, reinvented ourselves when us and when the new methods evolve new ways of engaging with customers and when we are when we are typically growing as a bigger company there's always several layers that comes in between the employees and the company so how can we continue to stay innovative? How can we be continuously be closer to the customers, right? So those involved uh, methods to be evolved over a period of time and we did that right. And uh, you know, uh, that is why uh, the Intuit product management culture is something that is, uh, that is always noted in the industry. Uh, uh, you know, uh, this culture has led the Silicon Valley on product and design thinking, uh, right? So uh, back in 2007 itself, uh, the concepts around uh, how design can be applied into the into the software industry perspective and what could be some of the framework around there uh, how how we can go into the direction of you know applying uh, you know design thinking into what we are doing uh, and uh, even a even more best example is actually eric rice in his book uh, you can see actually several case studies from into it uh, which is used as a reference while explaining the lean startup model itself Okay, uh, so that's all what we saw about Intuit as a product company. Now we are going to go into the secret sauce. Before that, let me take a pause here. Uh, see, you know, uh, some of you could have been uh, have been asking questions. Sumit, let's see. Um, so yeah, so the questions mostly have been around. Hey, uh, I cannot hear you, or audio and video are absolutely fine. So some people are having internet difficulties, others are not. So. But uh, awesome, Muthu, thank you for taking us through that journey, talking about how Intuit was born and how Intuit has a great mission to power prosperity around the world for both individuals and small businesses. And uh, I think what powers, like you very correctly mentioned, but powers it all is this product and design thinking culture yeah. at Intuit. We are absolutely product first and design first. And to remember that we are 35 years old when such things were actually not even heard of, forget about, talked about in the Valley. Uh, the Valley as we know it did not exist. And Intuit has actually had a huge hand to play in crafting this culture in the Valley. And thanks for actually taking us through that journey, Mutu. But now that we are here, uh, how do we do product management here in Intuit? is what I can't wait to hear from you. Absolutely, Sumit. Exactly. So, so you know, uh, what makes the product management culture in Intuit special? What what do the product managers here do uh, to to get the product right? Uh, and uh, and hence, what are some of the best practices that we could possibly be sharing with anyone who aspires to become a have some product manager? Uh, you know, uh, that's what we are gonna going to see next. So basically. Uh, we have looked at the several aspects of product management, how we are going through, you know, even, even for, let's say, taking a matured product, or if you are, if we are doing a, you know, new product innovation, uh, right, irrespective of that, how we are taking a feature, how, or how we are taking a product along the journey, and what are some of the critical elements that the 
pro PM has to uh, ha has to be doing and has to be uh, sewing at each of these phases uh, to build a uh, to build an awesome product is what we have um, uh, summarized in here and what we are going to cover next as well. Uh, so, an awesome product manager should develop deep customer empathy and that's that that has been the core to whatever we do at intuit what we call as a deep customer empathy to be noted um, and then uh, you know you should have the neck and the and the eye for spotting a real unsolved problem and what i mean by that will will also be covered in the session uh, and when you have the problem and the, the when you know your customer and you have the opportunity at the hand uh, then all you have to do is you have to think uh, you have to build to think through it right so you you will just go into the build measure learn cycle uh, how to how to build and evolve the uh, evolve the product together with your customers so those are the three elements let's say that we are going to uh, going to discuss about what an awesome product manager should be doing and uh, before we get into that, uh, I would like to get you uh, get your views uh, from the participants today and on what you are feeling uh, about these aspects. We are launching a poll here. Yes, let's go ahead and ask you guys to answer a few questions for us. Might I just start, Mutu, if you don't mind, by asking people to use a chat window to tell us what is it that you do today? There are hundreds of you. Absolutely, yeah. Use a chat window, type in, what is it that you do today um, at work, wherever else you are doing, and what brings you here uh, in this meeting, in this webinar? And we'll give it a minute for people to, not a minute, actually 10 seconds is more than enough. People have already started typing a lot of responses coming in. Thank you all. Aspiring product manager transitioning into PM, product deconstruction. Tear down data scientist. Oh my Interesting. God. I, I just can't keep up. It's just flowing through. All right. Thank you so much. Keep typing. Finish this, please, for me. This is going to be awesome because this will give us a sense of who you are and who you want to be and how we can help you. And I'm going to keep reading this as we launch this next poll for you guys. Now, imagine with what Muttu has mentioned to you up until now, you were to take this poll. What will you say to Swamato product manager lead, like a chief product officer of Swamato? Swamato is a company, it's a fictional company, doesn't exist. Mutu just created it. And the chief product officer of that company, which is you, wants to do something about it. Read the question and click. Some of you who are still typing, please finish typing fast and move on to the poll. Awesome. We're getting there really quickly. We have crossed 100. Let's see if we can cross very quickly to the hundreds that you guys crossed are crossed 150 already. 180. Oh okay, I was not looking for that one second. Uh, okay, oh, very 200 interesting. people have responded. And you keep going. Thank you so much for putting in the words as well as the clicks people on the panel are going to look through all of this and make sure we can tune this session to your needs. Yes. We have with us 330 plus participants today. Uh, interesting. So we have got more than 250 responses. Uh, Sumit, probably we, we could- go ahead uh, and show them exactly. what they have told us? Yes. I'm so sorry, guys, we're still clicking. I'm going to end the poll in three, uh, two, and one. Mutu, what the people have told us is probably an unequivocal yes to one answer. How do you think these guys are performing? Very, very interesting. Uh, very glad to see that result actually. You know, uh, a typical typical mistake or typical, let's say, um, uh, uh, with the solution thinking, generally what happens is that that, that is something that we have been used to do uh, in our, from our, right from our school days, let's say, from the education system, let's say. You know, typically when there is a problem around, when there is an opportunity around, we, we typically go wear the solution thinking hat and uh, start to go in the direction of how do I start to build it? 
right? So how, how, how do I create it? How, where do I get the resource? That's typically the thinking would evolve, but you guys have got it right really that you have to first go and engage with customers. Do really see what they want to do because in this case, for example, this is a development team trying to come up with an algorithm based on the data that they had. Of course, this is absolutely valid. That's how all the, all the technical researchers go, all the patents go, but then, you know, how, how do you actually put it into, uh, into, into the business use? How do you commercialize this innovation? It's, you will start it with your customers as a product manager. So absolutely, right. let's, uh, let's get, in, get into how at Intuit we are doing and we are engaging with customers. Uh, so at customer, you know, at, at, at Intuit, we always like to go and visit our customers face to face on the setting, on the place where they are, typically their workplace. Uh, and uh, we go and observe them. We spend a day with them or uh, uh, we, we observe them how they are working. Uh, you know, for example, what they are doing uh, before opening up the product, what are some of the typical things that they are doing? What is something that they are doing even after closing the product? And within the product, you know, uh, you know how how is the entry happening? You know, uh, what triggers them to get into it, and how they are engaging with it, right? So the entire work uh, uh, and uh, how they are going about their work is very very important. Mm -hmm. Typically in the small business space, because for them, remember any software that you bring in for them, it's actually not about the software at all for them. They are small business surviving uh, with the passion that they bring in and they are doing what they are doing because they love doing it and you are trying to enable them to do it better right so it's not about your software how your software can be better but it's purely about your customer and what is the, what is it that they are missing what is it that they are liking right so in this case for example this picture is actually uh, one of our customer uh, in his micro brewery using our software and we sitting next to him watching him you know asking him questions you know uh, being uh, you know letting him have a conversation with us about the product what is he critic about what what is that that we can learn from right and in, in this entire conversation we will always obsess over the problem not giving them the solution not giving them some of the workarounds etc right so it is it is about understand you know what is that problem that they are bringing into the table if something has not been obvious to them even though you have solved it in the product possibly you have not solved it right right so hence it is important for you to listen over to them and wherever possible take your team also along because there is no better way even for your product developers uh, to know what environment your customers are in uh, if you are not taking them along right so there is there is always a misconception about you know uh, customer speaking with customers is only a product manager job uh, and not a developer job it's not really that you can all, you know, it is actually advisable even for the development team and the product team to sit together with the customers. You are actually taking different aspects from it. You are gaining that empathy, which you are translating into the requirement of the products and they are actually the ones who are actually building it. And even for building that, that, that empathy is required as well. So wherever possible, do that as well to take your team along. Cool. Um, so with that, we are now going to go into the next poll quickly. All right, people have been asking a few questions, Mutu, by the way, around uh, what should be the sample size of the customers when we do customer empathy and customer research sessions, primary research, and also competitive and market research. Uh, Shubhankar asks, how should we approach that? Um, I think you may want to take that one live if you don't mind while I launch the next poll. Shouldn't we do a market competitive research and give a bit of direction to the user research, which is primary research, before engaging with the customer? In which order should we be doing this? Smooth? Perfect. So, so you know, uh, the primary research and the secondary research elements always complement, uh, uh, you know, the 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 uh, uh, complement of com uh, complement about your problem collection phase what do you want to learn about the uh, about the opportunity what is that what is really happening in the field but then what happens is uh, in some cases there are you know let's say the different order comes into picture depending on the use case that you are in but then in most of the cases it is actually starting with your customers 
because often if you see when you start to read about your uh, competitors when you start to read the secondary research what is happening is you are already going into some of the uh, some of the hypothesis and assumptions that have already been made right so you you are looking at some of the some of the you know analysis that has already been made and possibly there is chance that that you are missing out on a few things few first hand information of actually engaging with the customers right so that that research that you are reading is actually as good as the person who has actually done that research and the goal that he had while doing that research while it is absolutely good to have that uh, uh, have the secondary backing uh, it is also very very important to engage with your uh, customers in uh, in their workspace and actually start from there and then get on to the prime secondary research we are going to cover the secondary research as well uh, soon uh, but in spaces like uh, b2b uh, the business to business companies versus b2c companies typically what happens is in b2b companies there are typical challenges around engaging with your customers directly and when i specifically say end users because you know you might be able to directly engage with a uh, with an it admin or a someone who is uh, a decision maker influencer in the company but not directly with the end user right so there what happens is the sample size become becomes really really small and hence you may want to back it up with a lot of research analysis gotner reports etc right so there you require you know while you are doing primary research you also need a good amount of secondary research versus in the b2c it gives you also the gives you the flexibility to reach out to a huge number of base and actually when you see uh, that the that the uh, you know uh, that the results are going towards a certain direction and you see a pattern evolving till then you can of course do a primary research and then get into secondary Awesome. Hey, thank you, Mutu. So, shall we go ahead and launch the poll too? Yes. Poll two coming up right now, people. Now, Somato has uh, requested the CPO to go ahead and uh, start doing the next thing after you have got the necessary customer empathy, the deep customer empathy. What would you do next? Is the poll currently open? Feel free to also on the chat window start putting in a few verbatims if you like in addition to the thing that you select. And uh, my sincere request for questions that you're asking of me, uh, Abhishek, Niantha, the other folks, um, please put them in the Q&A panel. We are manning the Q&A panel for answering questions. And if you have comments, please put them in the chat window, not a problem at all. All right. Again, hundreds of folks, pretty active. We'll Perfect. We already see a clear trend evolving. Uh, do you want to share the results, uh, Sumit? Oh, my God. I don't think they need this session. They already know all of this, man. <laughs> exactly. You guys are awesome. All right. Uh, people are still clicking. I feel heartless about ending this poll now, but that will I do. Awesome people, thank you so much. Here are your results. You guys are awesome, like I said. Thank you. Motu, back to you. Exactly. So, uh, uh, again, a very interesting result. So, you, you have actually got it right. 70, 68 percentage of you actually feeling that, you know, immediately after uh, having the, uh, you know, the first set of problems by noticing your customers, working with your customers, engaging with your customers, it is now uh, the, uh, the, the, next, the, the, the next important thing that you should be doing is about actually spotting that real unsolved problems and the big opportunities that it can bring to the table for you as an individual or you as a company that is trying to solve the problem right so that is very very important i see that the second next is actually the brainstorming solution for each problem that is typically a trap because what happens is when you have a set of problems in the hand you immediately start to think about the solutions for each of them right uh, while it is good it is always advisable to park your solution thinking head for some time, some more time to identify even before you jump into the solutions for each of the problem, think about, is this a problem that you want to solve it? Is this a problem worth the solving, right? So because every, every resource in the world is actually limited, right? So you don't wanna go and put your time everywhere and you as a pm should really know that where should i be focusing on my uh, focusing my time where should i be picking up my fight and where should i not right so let me go into uh, the spotting big unsolved problems 
So uh, here, what I have is actually, you know, uh, uh, what we call the the framework of what we call as a customer-driven innovation. Uh, it's actually that you know now you have went ahead and uh, uh, you know engaged with your customers and you have a set of uh, uh, you know uh, uh, problems that you have noticed, some of the trends that you have noticed, opportunities that you have noticed, right? But now, where to concentrate? Where to focus? Right? So the 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 key essence of how you can uh, filter them down is actually by looking at what is an important unsolved customer problem, right? But at the same time, this problem, when you're picking up uh, from your list, the list of problems, you know, you have now come back and did the secondary research as well, validated, yes, these are some of the problem that is existing today, these are unsolved, et cetera, right? But then now, uh, even after that, you have to really, really look at, uh, is that something that we we as a you know it could be it could be if you are doing it yourself you as an individual or your organization or your organization and your partners and that's why we call it we and those we enable can solve it well really well right and in turn the by solving that problem you should be gaining a durable competitive advantage right if you are not gaining a significant advantage mileage uh, uh, the uh, basically the viability aspects from the product then you know that is not a way that you want to go with right that is not a problem that you may want to solve it is a real problem right uh, but then uh, if that is not going to help you in your vision, in your mission of where you are going towards, that's not a problem that you want to solve. Right? So that's exactly the focus that you have to do. You know, uh, while you have a bunch of problems, you should be able to prioritize them, filter it down, and make sure that it is solving the right problem that your organization or your mission as per that you want to solve, and that is bringing in that competitive advantage required. Cool. Okay, so with that, we are actually going to go into the next poll very quickly. All right, so the next poll is, uh, Somato has now requested CPO, which is you, to go ahead and solve well. Let's see what it's asking you. You have empathy. You have awesome empathy for your customer. You've actually zero down on what you want to solve for. Now, what will you do to solve that problem well? What would you do next? Go ahead and type your answers if you want on chat, as well as go ahead and click on the poll. Mutu, while that happens, one question that you could answer live, um, how do you estimate the value that a new feature delivers to your entire customer base? Uh, based on the input from a subset of customers, like you have very few customers that you talk to, but then you have a huge million people or million customer base. How do you extrapolate? How do you estimate? Is what Niket Johan is asking. Thanks, Niket, yep. for your question. Yeah. So, uh, so that's the that's the typical, let's say, the the opportunity sizing and the market sizing exercises that we do. Uh, but but in in case of relating it back from the research uh, onto onto where uh, uh, onto the solutions that you are bringing into the market, how you actually take it up is basically um, you are based on the research. You are going to have a set of you know the categories of your users called as your personas. Right, and then you are selecting a certain type of persona, having those important problems that you have filtered in the in the previous uh, picture that we talked about. You know, uh, for solving those problems well, right? So now what is happening is you have you know exactly the category of users. You know exactly you know whom you are you whom you are talking about. So that that is how your persona is laid out, and you 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 will be typically what what will happen is you will be estimating you know what is the size of such a users uh, that is there in the market and what is the size of such users that can be addressed by your solution in that market so there is an industry and within that industry there is a certain type of users that you have talked about having a certain problem so what is the total size of those such users in that industry and out of them how much of them you can be solving with so the the whole the what we call as the uh, target addressable mar market and the soli uh, solution um, 
and the solution opportunity that you can bring to them right so you know that that would become your whole uh, market sizing exercises but to you know uh, to simplistically uh, put it it's actually you know right from your persona and then you know the size of them and hence you can relate the problem that you are solving for them and hence the value which you can extrapolate that if it solves well for these users these users represents a category of users and hence that category brings the this much of opportunity is what you will be looking at awesome great Anything thank you so to much add for there sumit as well oh no not at all not at all answered it very well uh ending the poll now and giving you the results share results there you go matu interesting okay uh so you know uh this one we 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 specifically sort of made it a split between uh <laughs> <laughs> you know the answers that we did give right so there is there is yes there is multiple right answers uh because you have now uh, spotted your opportunity right now immediately after spotting your opportunity what is that you should be doing is the question that we raised to with you right and there are several things actually that you could do and uh, definitely not something uh, that you want to do is you know just build it out for the next 6 to 8 months and do a big launch one year later in the market when that need is ceasing to exist or your competitor has already launched something to cater or the market has already changed to over from that problem right so that's not definitely uh, but then you know if you look at the any of the other ones of course there are multiple right ones here but if you look at let's say you know in a sequence what is that some first thing that you want to look at it's basically you know what is happening is when you when you have uh, when you are thinking about an opportunity and the solution for that opportunity uh, the solutions always comes up with assumptions right and hence the rapid thinking around it the experimentation surrounded to validating that assumption is very important let's see how uh, how it goes when it when it comes to uh, now now you have engaged with your customers you have done your primary and secondary research well and you have selected the problem which is worth solving which is something that you want to focus on uh, that brings up the big opportunity now how do you do it is actually by building and thinking through it which is the build measure learn cycle as we call right uh, and the dag and the framework that you see over here is what we call as the design for delight framework uh, that is a that is the framework that we use for any of the let's say the uh, product or the module or the feature that we want to bring we typically follow this up, uh, framework uh, so what it brings is you know basically from the problems that you have collected and the opportunities that you have noticed uh what you have to do is you know you have to really really go broad first right yeah, because what happens is you know for the, the you will be thinking about some immediate solutions but then you there will be more ideas within the team possibly that could have been solved in a different way there could be some uh, you know inspirations that you want to gain from how else market is solving the same problem and hence it is very very important to first go broad right so in the problem phase what has happened initially you you picked up a theme and when you were interacting with the customers it it actually you went broad and then you brought it down into one focused problem in the spotting opportunity phase now you are again trying to go broad from the once you have spotted the opportunity to make sure that you have covered all possibilities of how this problem can be solved well and then you start to go narrow again in terms of picking those ideas uh, and what what has to be experimented with and when it comes to experiment typically where we first start with is every solution will have some underlying assumptions do you want to validate every assumption that your solution bring on to the table need not be because there are some assumptions which which could have been already proved tried tested in the market right for like for example you know uh, do do you have to really validate if you are uh, designing a solution for an urban market working professional uh, you know do you have to validate that they would be doing let's say some sort of a booking when it comes to let's say any any uh, let's say a cine hall booking or a hotel booking would they be actually using their mobile phone with an internet connection to book something you need not probably need not value uh, you know uh, validate that assumption right because of the category of customers that you are talking about and the attributes that you have studied in the persona possibly those assumptions could already be safely made 
but at the same time there are going to be assumptions which are going to be which you have to validate because these are possibly the first time assumptions that you are taking this persona because he is doing a he could possibly be doing b that could have become a big assumption which would have made your solution not to fly off at all when you actually design a very innovative solution and you launch and it is not going up and you can easily understand it is actually because there could have been a very uh, you know underlying assumption which you probably like overlooked at that phase and because of that your product is actually not taking off very well right uh, and what is also very important for a product manager in the build measure learn cycle is actually your technology and the data understanding are you able to you know it's not that depending on uh, it's it's not that you need to be technical enough to uh, code out a product that's not what we are talking about unless you are handling a, uh, you know a technology heavy platform or a product let's say right uh, we are talking about in in most of the technology uh, flavors uh, you know the pd the, the develop, development teams can already do an amazing job with respect to technology but you as a product leader you are bringing an informed perspective on how to leverage the leading tech edge technologies for the use cases you are bringing into the table and the data that your product is producing and how the some of those data can be used as well while you are building the product as well as from your experimentation right your experimentation is pro producing a lot of data and how do you interpret that data that understanding is also very important for a product manager right now we come to the most important aspect which is pivoting right and uh, how do you measure your success and how do you pivot as required right this is a very important aspect uh, the when you are doing any experiments you don't go to do any experiments without setting a metric typically what happens is sometimes uh, uh, you know folks say that you know let's let's do an experiment to validate it and then based on the results they say okay they they pick up the positive elements of the results and then they say you know hence i am successful because you wanted to prove yourself right possibly right but what is important is you should have set your metric before you actually launch your experiment and that's when you are actually validating the the result uh, the result against the metric you have set beforehand and these could be the business me metric uh, like how many users how many um, uh, what is the revenue etc or this could be an engagement metrics how long they spend daily active users monthly active users etc right and and based on that you are either going to incrementally build your product or you are going to pare it down or you you may want to even pivot based on the learning that you have from the market cool right so, we are at 5 minutes to go motu so we should probably jump to the next section perfect uh, yeah so that's a quick uh, recap for you guys which is basically you know uh, 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 the three critical elements that we saw that is you know very very important go and engage with your customers develop deep empathy for them spot real and solved problems it is not every problem that you see on your uh, on your road that you want to solve when you are building your product there will be several opportunities several problems that you will be seeing it evolve but do you want to go and solve each of them no you pick your problems pick your fights see where the opportunity lies why see if it is matching with your vision and mission and and pick it up wisely uh, the ones that can bring value to you and your organization right and and remember the build measure learn cycle uh, so you know uh, uh, you are staying close to the customers even in the build cycle right so you are building something incrementally going back to your customers and measuring the success learning and you know uh, and incrementally build on the solutions and you even pivot if that is required to be the case cool uh, as we are also let's, running uh, close yes, to the time yeah let's let's bring up the last couple of slides and Perfect. wrap i'm trying to answer as many questions as i can online 
we will miss a few but i will try to do my best and then we'll take a couple of questions of course if you folks are going to stay on after the mark we can take questions also after so we will answer your questions right after if your questions are unanswered just stay back for a minute or two and we'll answer them but mutu let's keep going and close sure. the session now so sure. definitely okay so here is the here is the part that i had mentioned at the beginning about those who are we know a, a lot of you here are actually aspiring to be a product manager right from business schools coming out from the business schools and here are some of the tips of how do you get started right so the questions about you know where i should be coming from what should be the typical quality that a product manager should be having you know we did already see that how you should be close to your customers and the problems and how you should be building and here we are seeing the let's say the soft side of it how you can equip yourself what should be the background etc so uh you know uh if you ask me you know where do pms come from is there a typical background from where they are coming from no there is you know pms come from diverse backgrounds you can come from any background and be successful the most popular one is though uh, probably the in the indian setup it is actually that you know because uh, you know most of us actually uh, do our engineering and then think what to become right so it's it's basically you know after, only after we graduate from our engineering schools we start to think about you know what next in our career uh, uh, so possibly the direction went in that way so it's it's the the most of the times what we see is it's actually the bachelor in engineering and then they come into the technology role or the business analyst or a consultant and then at a later point in time let's say in their mid career they get into an mba and come into product management uh, but if you see is that the only way only background that can build a successful product manager absolutely not you can be coming from completely diverse diverse background and you can still be a very very successful product manager if you are if you are staying close to your customers if you are able to spot the right problems then you can still sign and rise and be an awesome product manager uh and uh you know uh if you are aspiring to be a product manager uh the 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 best way that you can actually do is pretend you are already one imagine that you are already a product manager it's going to be fun you right you just you just think that you are already one and how you can do that is actually our product tier down session i even saw in uh, in our chats you know some of you had mentioned about tier down it's uh, it's very interesting to see because that's a sort of a format that we do uh, as well uh, from intuit where we actually take a successful product and uh, travel behind in the timeline and see how the product could have evolved what what could have been some of the aspect and the and the lens of the product manager for that product. product would have been evolved right um uh that that is a typical session that we do but you know does it stop you to wait for the session no just pick up a product any product around you uh say amazon music uh, you know any any product around you right it could be a software product hardware product pick one and start to tear down right so why they have built what they have built what could have gone behind these features you are seeing features but possibly what could have led to those features what would have that pm thought about it right there is no best way to learn uh, product management than actually doing it uh, and that could even become your portfolio because once you do it you just go ahead and publish it in linkedin publish it in medium you will get followers you will you, that becomes your portfolio as well which is very important to transition right? right and then you can do pro bono at a startup or you can build your own product or you can join communities of course there are formal trainings available as well uh, where you can register yourself and upskill yourself as well uh, but as i mentioned the best is build your own or uh, tear down an existing product and learn from it awesome Hey Mathu, uh, thank you so much for the awesome session. I'm going to so that the people before they start dropping off get a chance to do a quick poll on NPS. As a product manager, you will use NPS over and over again, all of you, and we are product managers. So, if you were to rate this as a product, this session, how likely is it that you would recommend this Intuit Virtual Tech Talks uh, to a friend or colleague? go ahead and take that poll on your screen and mutu i'll start reading off the questions which i not yet answered to you you can start answering them people hang on if you want to listen to the answers to your question the first question mutu is uh, what's the future of design thinking assuming we have a lot coming up in areas uh, such as ai and ml 
Yeah, so that's an interesting question, right? So basically, you know, the 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 world of design thinking versus the world of AIML. Uh, what happens is the one world says, uh, look at your data that you have generated, and possibly you already have all the answers what you are looking for right there. The other world says there is no better way to go and sit with your customer and learn from them, uh, you know, uh, and engage with them and understand from them, right? Uh, so is it that, you know, these two worlds going to compete with each other? Is it that the AI can, you know, overrule that, you know, you can, you can look for all your answers right only from your data and not from your customers? Absolutely not because it is always going to be you know a combination it is always going you are going to always take it in a way like you know um, uh, these are going to complement each other there are a certain aspects of your customers like for example you know how they think uh, how, how they are going through a certain uh, certain journey you know uh, what is the feeling when they are doing something what they are doing before using your product and after using your product there's a lot of things that data cannot answer for you versus there is also equally important and missed out things on the other side which data can answer for you right for example you know exactly what is the time that they are spending what is how they are doing a typical transaction you know uh, possibly user may not even recall or they may phrase it differently but your data can tell that absolutely this is the place where they are getting stuck and hence it needs to be solved Right. So, you know, these two, these two doesn't compete with each other. These two actually complement very well with each other. All right. Thanks, Motu. Uh, one more question to wrap up and thank you, everybody. I think most of you have taken the poll and uh, it's been an awesome, awesome session uh, for me, at least. Um, I loved the energy. All of you were clicking away, typing away. I was furiously trying to answer the questions. Uh, thank you so much for people you have attended. Uh, numbers are dropping quickly, little bit by little bit. Uh, but Motu, if you can, please answer this next question. Uh, hello, sir. Anonymous attendee says, how do we select which problem to solve? There may be two, three brainstorm ideas which seem very appealing. Is there a method to solving, picking one solution? Yeah. Uh, 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 it, it did start with problem. And then did you, uh, did you actually sift into the uh, ideas and then picking the ideas? Or is it actually the picking the problem? I think uh, maybe both, maybe a bit of both, man. Okay. Uh, going narrow okay. on the solution, going narrow on the problems. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Interesting. So, so uh, typically, one thing that I want to, you know, uh, uh, tell there, uh, even before uh, getting into that, is basically you have to keep your problem world and your solution world different. You have to have, let's say, a virtual boundary between these two. When you are ex when you are in your discovery phase, when you are trying to find the problems and opportunities, do not mix it up with ideas because that will kill your curiosity. You will start already to think in the direction of how will I implement the solution, how will I go ahead, etc. Right. So this has to be two different worlds. When you are thinking about problems, it's always about the problems. Focus down and narrow down on the problems later after going broad to collect all the problems. Similar. Similarly, after doing brainstorming, uh, collecting a bunch of ideas, then you will narrow down on the solutions that you have. Now, in these two phases, you have different ways that you could use to how you can narrow down. For problem phase, narrowing down is where we used, for example, what we called as the um, you know, the, the customer driven uh, innovation framework that I was mentioning uh, about. This is exactly how you can filter down and get to really the problems that you wanna be solving with, right? And similarly, when it comes to your uh, ideas and then how you wanna narrow down on your ideas, right? So it's basically, you know, uh, 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 by going back to your customers, by validating, you know, you don't want to validate all those, all the ideas, of course, but once you have you as a product manager able to relate a few of your ideas very closely to the uh, problems that you have identified, now you are picking those ideas and validating, uh, doing rapid experimentation with your customers, evolving together with your customers to, uh, to make them select the best uh, solution for them. Awesome. Great. Thank you, Mutu. Uh, a couple of more questions there. Uh, you know, only one I would probably ask, and I know you've been talking for a while. So please honor us with one more answer. What is the career trajectory of a PM at Intuit? 
Absolutely. So, uh, you know, uh, very few companies, in fact, offers, uh, you know, multiple levels in, 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 in PM career uh, uh, and Intuit is one of them. Uh, so we, we do have the, let's say, the associate level or what we call as a PM1 and then a product manager level two, the, where, where it's like uh, already the, let's say, the senior level and then the senior product manager uh, 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 where you are looking at, let's say, the, uh, the tactical aspects more and, and less. Uh, you know less onto the actual execution uh, of the of the product where you are working closely with the team and then going up one level where we uh, where you can even transform into two two directions uh, because even as a product thinker and a product leader you when you evolve and come to the next level you can either choose to be a group product manager or you can choose to be a principal product manager as we call because these two leaders are actually you know let's say let's say the level wise the same they are the they are they are the product leaders they are looking at a set of portfolio that can be delivered etc but the difference between them is the group product managers controls a group where there are a reporting uh, structure also with you where you are uh, you have a set of pms reporting to you to deliver the portfolio whereas as a principal product manager you have a portfolio but you may choose uh, not to have the people responsibility for those who doesn't want to take up the people responsibility as well and of course from there you can go on to become a vp product management as well awesome great stuff motu uh, i don't know if we have time i don't think we have time to answer more questions there are a few still pending but um uh, i i would i would have to end the poll and i would request motu to please uh, end the session for us and uh, i could not be more thankful and more excited about all 300 of you uh, thank you for joining us today Matu, take it home. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Actually, actually, today is a working day and you have been taking time to come in and listen to us and get on to the, uh, and you have shown your interest on the product management. Very, very glad to, uh, glad to see that. Uh, thank you, everyone, again. Thank you for joining. Thank you.